Um, I'm Karen Levy. I'm really very grateful and honored to have the opportunity to present to you um, some work that I've done with several of my colleagues at Cornell, folks across the spectrum from computer science to law to social science. Um, and this paper really arises from like hours and hours of conversations that the six of us have had in various subgroups over the last several years um, that we decided to write a paper about. So a lot, in large part, our discussions were really driven and motivated by just the tremendous success of the Fat Star community in bringing attention to the potential that computing has to address social and economic problems. Obviously, there are lots of examples of that. But along with, oops, maybe, there we go. But along with those, with that promise, comes lots of critiques, which many folks in this room have, or folks on this panel have already alluded to, so I'll, I won't go through them in detail. But by and large, these are critiques largely about um, the, the sort of the focus or the locus of intervention that computing takes. So one of, one of the prominent critiques that Ben Green has really nicely highlighted in some of his work is the nature of computational solutions to be somewhat incrementalist in nature, so not to maybe address the root causes of deep social and economic injustice, but to maybe sort of play around a little bit at the end, right? Like this is the way that the critique is often rendered, that it's sort of a tinkering that might not only not address root causes, but might even actually draw our attention away from those causes or draw political will away from them. So there has been this set of critiques on the other side, some of which are quite well founded. And what we wanted to do was sort of cut a path between what we see as the real promise of this community, a real opportunity to leverage computing's unique attributes towards social change, and the set of critiques that says, like, computing is not the only game in town. There are lots of ways we might be interested in propagating social change, and they're not purely technical. So what we did was we decided to articulate a, like a menu of, these are just illustrative, it's not meant to be like a hard and fast typology, but a set of ways in which computing can help to address social change as sort of a constructive ally alongside other routes to change. And what those are are that compute, oh, it's right up there, is that computing can help us to diagnose social problems how they, and how they manifest in technical systems, that the formalization that models require helps us to really put our finger on what exactly it is that we're doing, um, that computing can sometimes rebut policy efforts that aim to use computing towards social change, and that computing can shed new light on old social problems in a new way. So I'll talk through all, through all of these quite quickly. Obviously, the paper has much more detail about each. So first of all, one, one of the, what we see as the chief promises of computational work is that it has a really unique capability of helping us to sort of assess the shape and depth of social problems when they're instantiated in technical systems. So if you think of like likely some of your favorite work in this area, right, Cla studies that we now see as real classics stemming from LaTanya Sweeney's work now seven years ago diagnosing the nature of bias in online ad delivery, all the way up to more recent work by several folks in this room looking at bias in face recognition technology in NLP, um, including some of the more recent work looking at and trying to document um, so potential sources of bias in the ML pop pipeline. All of these projects in, in our understanding of them have as their goal not necessarily to propose solutions to the problems that they're finding, but instead to like give us a really, really clear sense of data and sense of mechanism for how it is that these problems are occurring. Now one, I'm gonna, for each of these, I'll give you like a little caution. Um, we don't think any one of these is like always done well or like doesn't have some risk to it. So the risk here, one of the risks, is that is Goodhart's law, which I know has arisen in, in some of the tutorials yesterday, so folks are likely familiar, that sometimes when we articulate a metric, it, that metric can easily become a target and then it ceases to be a good metric. So we do have to be careful that articulating, that diagnosing a problem doesn't sort of implicitly bring along with it the idea that that, that becomes the target for, for intervention. Okay, our second role is computing as a formalizer. So models are often actually bemoaned for their capacity to take these like big questions and turn them into calculations, right? So this has its problems, many of which are ably artic articulated on this panel, but it also has some potential political benefit. So if we think about some of the policy aims we often have, they're quite vague and ambiguous in nature, things like the best interests of the child or the best qualified job applicant or the lowest risk defendant, things like that. Those are pretty hard, actually, sometimes to get your hands around, right? And one kind of nice aspect of building a model is that it requires us to formalize our inputs, our assumptions, our objective function, um, in a, our constraints, in a way, actually, that can give us a lot to grab onto if we're, what we're interested in is political action around those things. So in the paper, we talk about this in several contexts, but most notably the risk assessment context. Um, and we talk about how the community uh, of advocates around risk assessment has actually like gotten quite a lot of leverage out of the fact that this formalization exists, right? And so in the best case, 
it can actually be a set of touch points for democratic deliberation and, and for advocacy in the process. Of course, just because formalization is there doesn't mean and is required doesn't mean that this always happens in a transparent and inclusive way, as we know. Um, but we might think of it as a necessary if insufficient condition for that kind of action. And then, of course, also not all values that we might care about are equally commensurable, equally quantifiable in a model. So this isn't a silver bullet, but it does um, have some promise. Third, we talk about computing as rebuttal. What we mean here is that oftentimes, as you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hype around AI. Um, policymakers often want to point to AI when they're not really sure, when they want to do something they're not really sure how, right? So this happens, we've seen this happen in content moderation. Um, ICE, I guess, put out an RFP wanting to know how they could tell which immigrants were likely, most likely to, be, to become productive members of society. We've seen this in the cryptography context. And one thing that computational folks can do really well, are uniquely equipped to do, is to, it's sort of like the, the opposite of solutionism, is to tell policymakers, you know what, this is not the tool you're looking for, like this is not gonna do the thing that you think it's going to do. Um, and we've seen this in the, certainly in the encryption context, some of the uh, scholarship about that, the impossibility of backdoors. In the, the uh, folks in this room have done some work in the context of ICE's extreme vetting um, program telling them like there is no algorithm that will do the thing that you think you wanna do. And impossibility results also sort of serve this function, right? You can't simultaneously meet these multiple definitions of fairness at the same time. Now the worry here is that if we focus a lot on what it is that's possible and what it is that an algorithm can do, we might lose sight of this other and potentially more important question about whether that's the algorithm we want at all, right? So we may overemphasize the role of accuracy here and sort of take our eye off the ball of whether this is the system we want implemented in the first place. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. Do you guys get the, there's a little dinosaur because it's, it's in Jurassic Park they talk about this. That didn't go over great, okay. <laughs> Finally, uh, we talk in the paper about computing as synecdoche. Synecdoche is a literary term that means when a part stands in for the whole, right? So if you talk about like a car but you say, oh I got new wheels, that's an example of a synecdoche. And we think computing can actually function in a similar way because computing, the, the problems that we care about are often these like big, long systemic problems like poverty and capitalism and labor issues, like huge discrimination, like huge, huge problems that can be like kind of tough to get a handle on from a policy perspective. Um, and it can also, it can also, because they've been with us for such a long time, we, the public often has sort of a sense of like ignorance towards them. So one thing computing can do is we can actually sort of leverage the hegemony of algorithms in order to draw new, attentions, new attention to those problems sometimes. And I think the best example of this is Virginia Eubanks' book, Automating Inequality, which I'm sure many folks know, which Virginia is fundamentally concerned about poverty, not about algorithms. But she wrote this book about algorithms used in, anti, in poverty contexts as a way to draw attention and to pull, like, to pull attention both from our community and from the more general public towards this problem of poverty. So it can be really effective in that way. Of course, the risk is if we don't use it as a lens, right, if we restrict our attention only to the technical aspects of those problems, that can turn computing into a scapegoat for the larger problem and can maybe keep us from addressing it in other ways. So just to sum up quickly, these are this is just a summary slide. What we hope here is that the Fat Star community is already doing a lot of these things, um, but we think that this sort of set of framings maybe gives us a way to understand the ways in which we can be a constructive ally to other folks uh, in the, with the goal of uh, executing broader social change. Thanks. <laughs>